So the thing I say to people about the holidays is you have to give yourself grace. Number one, nothing is going to happen if you had an extra cookie. Don't go out with your friends and try to be like enjoying time with people and be overly controlling about everything that's around. Number two, do not not eat food. Don't starve yourself in anticipation of going to an event. Just eat normally throughout the day at your normal cadence so that you don't binge at some party. Also, you could just say no. You don't have to go to every single thing. That's another thing that people forget. Like, just say no. It's fine. Hello and welcome to The Glow Podcast. I'm Lisa Brooks-Mills. Food is medicine, and doctors spend such a small amount of time in nutrition. Dietitians and nutritionists play a vital role in health and healing. You may think working with a dietitian is out of reach because it's too expensive. Our guest today is doing good work in the world to help make it more accessible. Today, I welcome the lovely Vanessa Rosetto. Vanessa is a registered dietitian, the co-founder of Kalina Health, and the dietitian intern director at New York University. Essence Magazine named Vanessa one of the top nutritionists who will change how you think about food. Vanessa is passionate about helping her clients take an active role in their health journey. She hopes to make a positive impact on people as they navigate their way through understanding nutrition. Food gets tangled up with emotions for so many of us at any time of year, especially during the holidays. Vanessa reminds us to give ourselves grace and the gift of rest. I hope you enjoy your time with Vanessa as much as I did. In her Instagram bio, she writes, not a magician, pretty close. And I had that sense of magic with her. Be sure to listen all the way to the end when I ask a few questions submitted by our GLOW members. Also, I encourage you to check out the GLOW playlist complementing this conversation. The classes help support digestion and mindful eating. Vanessa Rosado, welcome to the Glow Podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. You're a dietitian and a nutritionist, helping people take an active role in their health journeys and helping make a positive impact on people as they navigate their way through understanding nutrition. So before we get started and dive in, how and when did you become passionate about and interested in the field of nutrition? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I I actually, um, I always say this, that I'm like my parents' biggest disappointment because I'm not a doctor. It's really funny. The other day, my aunt was in the supermarket and she picked up a Bon Appetit and opened, like she said, she opened it up and there I was. So she like calls my aunt. Well, she calls my mom while she's online. Like, oh my gosh, did you know that Vanessa's in this magazine? My mom's like, yeah, but she's not a doctor. So like, who cares? Um, so <laughs> it was like so funny. <laughs> um, but I, um, I was always interested in science and medicine. And in college, I gained 50 pounds. I'm like really lucky. My mom like didn't have a scale in the house and like wasn't like talking about her weight or anything. We just like ate food. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, my mom is from Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. So she's in America with her children and her husband, and she's able to access food um, and feed us. So it wasn't a thing. Um, And I always ate at home. And the food that I ate was like, fresh and had vegetables and there were fruits. So I, but I didn't know anything about food. So of course, when I got to college, I just ate what I liked. And then I gained 50 pounds. And then when I moved back home and my mom was back to cooking all my food, I lost 50 pounds like pretty quickly, but I didn't understand why. And then I decided to see a dietitian because I was like, well, I think a dietitian is somebody who can help me. And she did. She like explained how food affected my body. And, you know, there was no like fad, there was no gimmick. It was just straight science. And from there I lost another 15 pounds. Mm. And like, I was really just going to, to understand. Cause I was like, well, I, I didn't feel good eating the way that I ate in college, obviously who does. And then, <laughs> and, and then I did, but I didn't understand. So she explained and that was it. And I was like, wow, I'd like to do that for people. Like I would like to be able to, not have to deal with patients in this like really acute situation, but still make an impact on people's health. And then I decided to go back to school and become a dietitian. just like that. And that was in New York or where, where did you? Yeah. Okay. It was in New York. Yeah. So I I went to Fordham in the Bronx and then I um, 
then I, I lost all this weight, went to the dietitian, and then got my master's um, uh, from N- and did the internship and everything through NYU. Oh, wow. What an amazing experience. Yeah. It was really interesting because, you know, you do your training in these New York City teaching hospitals where, like, medicine is really happening. So yeah. you understand, I mean, like, the, the pace is, like, really cool. And you see, like, the craziest things, which are, right. was, like, fun, really. I, I had a really great experience working in the hospitals in New York City. Like, that was, that's that's where it's at. <laughs> yeah. That's like a movie in itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Intense, intense. A lot of fun. Well, as you know, um, and from what I read doctors, and we talk about this a lot, people in the wellness space, like w- doctors spend such, you know, like I think an average of like a percent of their total lecture time um, in medical school learning about nutrition. And I read that the average time spent learning about food as medicine falls short of the National Research Council's recommendation for a baseline nutrition curriculum. Um, According to this report from the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic, nutrition plays a critical role in the prevention and treatment of many chronic diseases. And diet is one of the most significant risk factors for disability and premature death in the United States. This may seem obvious for those of us that are aware and interested in wellness, but I think it's I think it's great that more conversations are being had around this, um, and we can see why the roles of nutritionists are so, so important, so crucial. Um, as you said, not just oh, not only in just prevention or as part of treatment plans, but just in terms of general education yeah, and helping people create, a, as, your, as your passion that I've read about for you is just creating a, a different type of relationship than they might have known with food in general. So I wonder if we could just speak a little bit to that in terms of the, the need for nutritionists in, in the, as you said, in a hospital setting and in, in any medical setting, because quite simply, there's just the lack of it coming from, uh, you know, a general practitioner, surgeon, et cetera. Yeah. I think that like the, first part is that people don't really understand that nutrition is a modality that can elicit great change, right? And Mm -hmm. they think that, that it's like an add on when it's actually a discipline in of itself, right? Like, so Mm -hmm. in the hospital, the physician relies on the dietitian to execute complex algorithmic feedings of patients, not just diet education, In the hospital, when I worked on transplant, what I did was very crucial because when somebody has a transplant, they're immunocompromised, they need to understand what will happen to them if they get foodborne illness, if Mm. like how they're eating their food, how that affects their labs, how that affects the medication, right? That, I mean, nutrition biochemistry is is also another discipline, right? Mm. So there's so much that happens within nutrition, but people don't understand that partly because the license is not protected, right? So anyone can call call themselves a nutritionist, but they don't have the same training that dietitians have, right? right? So like, so, and there's, no, I'm not saying that a health coach isn't useful or like, that's not it. It's just that we are not the same. You don't know how to write a TPN order and I do. And that is the difference between actually like saving someone's life and not right. So those are just like some of those nuances and medical nutrition therapy, which is what we are taught to, um, to disseminate is very specific. And so people want to like blur those lines and cross them over. And, and I think that because we have a lot of celebrities that dabble in the nutrition space and get themselves noticed, then people who are registered dietitians feel like well, I have training, like true, true training. So like, I should be able to do the same thing. It just like muddies the waters a lot. Yes. And that's, yeah. that's unfortunate. And that's why people don't understand that we do have a really big job and we can, we want to collaborate with physicians. We want to teach regular people about food and how it affects their bodies. We want wellness to be for everyone. Um, and it can be, we just have, we have to work towards that. Um, so I I mean, I I think that, you know, with my private practice and the fact that we take insurance, 91% of our patients 
exercise their insurance benefits to see us, it makes it more accessible. I think that's important. That's like a step. Um, but it's a it's a big mountain to climb for sure. I do want to touch on Kalina Health's your private practice that you yeah. co-founded. Um, but before we get to that, maybe it'd be good just to just to give the overall difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. Yeah. So to be a dietitian, you have to take these classes that are mandated by our governing body. Then from there, you can apply for a dietetic internship. Only 50% of the people that apply to become a registered dietitian actually match. So dietitians are matched into a program or, per, or prospective dietitians are matched into a program similar to a physician, for example. And so you apply and then you do more coursework and then you do 1,200 hours mandated of training in a hospital some you can do some community setting but most places most places are in the hospital and the reason for that is that if you can apply the medical nutrition therapy if you could see patients from a medical perspective mm -hmm. then you're able to help them in in the outpatient setting right because we know also lifestyle medicine so if you come to me and present with all these labs and all these things okay that's fine but then i'm also trained to talk to you about like behavior change motivating you what stage of change you're in all of those things so we're the only ones that can really like marry that together mm. whereas a nutritionist right because the license is not protected so you could just read a book and then wake up and say i'm gonna do i'm gonna be a nutritionist and i'm gonna charge people and there's nobody that can stop you Wow. And so that's, which is like, okay, you know, I mean, I'm not saying you didn't learn or whatever. I mean, maybe you took a course, like, I don't know what your training is. There's that. But what if somebody comes to you and they have diabetes and you think it's okay to, to treat them? Because that has happened. Right. Is there anything being done about that? Or are people like the governing board sort of looking at that? No, no, mm -hmm. the governing body actually, a, the a governing body actually allows other professions to pay for certifications in nutrition mm. it's really not it's it's hard it's really hard yeah. you're you are like the governing body is the one that's murkying the waters right I think you've been in the Bon Appetit magazine a, co a few times, no? Or I, I know just just once where people really noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe let's let's that's on my list of questions. So maybe let's jump to that since your yeah. your sweet aunt noticed it in the store and called your mom all excited. Um, so yeah, I think we should talk about the importance of bringing more diversity into the field of nutrition, and this is something that's highlighted in in your article in the Bon Appetit magazine, and we can um, link to that article in the show notes. But I think it's a, an important part of the conversation in helping bring awareness um, that only 13% of registered dietitians are people of color, and it's keeping, as you said, an entire field of medicine from helping people who need the care most. Yep. So maybe if you could just share just a little bit, I, I think this is an important part of the conversation. It's really interesting. You know, in 2013, the New York Times ran an article on a dietitian who was charging $10,000 for a package. And she is no, she's not trained any different than me, right? She went to NYU, did her internship at Mount Sinai. She just whatever. This is what she did. She was getting paid for it. If you read that article and you saw her, you would think that seeing a dietitian is for the very wealthy, is for the elite. It's for people who are rich and white, and that's it. And that might be very far away from where you are. That also doesn't really represent the, the world at large, the country. Right. And so that's off-putting. So of course, right, people are like, well, I can't afford a dietitian, so I'm just going to use like a Noom or a Weight Watchers or whatever, because that's the thing that I can actually afford. And that's my that's my best bet. And it's accessible to a it's degree. It's accessible. Yeah. That's right. Also, a dietitian is actually the worst return on an investment for your education, if you like read the studies. And so if if I excel in science, and I grew up in a housing project, and I have to support my family. Am I going to go into debt and pay and get paid fifty thousand dollars a year, or am I going to go into debt and take a chance and be a nurse, be a PA, be a doctor where I can command a higher salary? Of course, I'm going to do those other things, right. Right? right? And so, the more that our field 
our field just keeps putting up barriers. So like a new thing is that you have to have your master's degree now before you can sit for your RD exam. Mm. So you'll do your internship, then you complete your master's degree, then you sit for your RD exam. So it's just more schooling and more time where you're not getting paid. Whereas if you get, if you do your internship, you take your exam, you could go work and you could have your employer pay. Only, uh, only doctors and lawyers work straight through or do do school straight through and then go to work, right? Everybody else mm -hmm. gets their master's while they're working. But, but their response, the academy's response is that, well, we found that people with master's degrees are better trained. And it's like, okay, well, if that were true, then you would mandate that the master's degree be in nutrition and you don't mandate that. You just mandate that the master's degree is in anything. It sounds like a voice like yours is needed on this. Yeah, yeah. So but it's, what's funny is that some people from the governing body have called me about my article to tell me that my article was triggering. And I was like, well, that's interesting. All the stats that I use are from your website. They're your stats. That's your data. And if so, if they're triggering, that me that's something to look at. Right. That's right. I, was like, I, I go, I didn't say anything. I said only the facts. There was no charge right. behind it. There, I didn't. I just said, you have to do better. And she's like, well, we are doing better. I'm like, well, show me how. You're not. You're not doing anything to diversify the field, to elevate the profession. The, the people at the top aren't making people see what good dietitians actually can do. Yeah, they're not making it easy. That sounds like for sure. No, no. And then, you know, the unpaid internship and you've got loans on top of it, that gets really tricky. Yeah, if somebody's $200,000 in student loan debt. So yeah. I'm the dietetic internship director at New York University. Mm -hmm. And if someone comes to me and they tell me that they are deeply in debt, I remind them at the, the cost of New York University and that if being a dietitian is what is truly in their heart, we might not be the right program for them because $1,925 per credit to only make $50,000 a year, the math does not add. Yeah. So this is, that needs to be fixed. It yeah. sounds like, yeah. 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 Mm. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for, I, like I said, we'll link to this article. I think it's important that these conversations are brought to light because that's, you know, the precursor, hopefully to ignite some change at some point. I mean, it's obviously not going to happen overnight based on the response that the article that you got from the article from these folks, but hopefully, you know, it's, it's voices like yours. It's people like you that are, you know, keep, keep pointing, keep looking. Right. Otherwise right. nothing's going to change. That's right. So yeah. well, thank you for, I appreciate that. Thanks. As a, yeah, as a person that cares about health and wellness and that wants as much as we can to give access equally across the board, it's it's a challenge. And so I appreciate your voice in the conversation. So as you mentioned, you're the dietetic intern director at the at the at New York University. I was curious, like what what does this work look like for you in, in general? And I also sort of had a follow up a question, was wondering, and we'll get to Kalina Health, but how has your work there helped informed your work with your own private practice? Yeah, I think it's the other way around is that mm. like Kulina helps me to inform the work at the university because, you know, university is a big behemoth, right? And they, everything is like very cookie cutter and by the book. And it's very hard to innovate in some of these departments and our department being one of them, it's hard to inno innovate there for a number of reasons. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's easy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, before COVID, we were trying to really make some good changes to the program and then COVID happened. And our main job was making sure that students were trained appropriately in order to be able to pass their exams. Mm -hmm. um, and also we have to report to the governing bodies every 10 years. And so of course that fell on an accreditation year. So that was also, that's also super fun. Um, <laughs> so being a dietetic inter internship director, it's a lot of moving parts, right? You have to like maintain connections to all the people in the space in the New York City metro area and beyond, but mainly in the New York City metro area because those are the people that you need to train your students. So you are constantly having to reach out and go places and meet with people, and which is always nice to see everyone, but you know, I'm like an extroverted 
introvert so it's like, <laughs> so like I do it because I have to and everyone's like you're so personable and I'm like I know but I just want to sit on my couch and watch the marvelous <laughs> Mrs. Maisel and Succession so there's that you know and making sure you know you're like check on the people and you have to like everybody's information is in your calendar because you want to mm. make sure you send them notes and know that you appreciate all the work that they do and their commitment to training the students like it doesn't like I do genuinely appreciate that, but a, a way for me to show my appreciation is to always make sure I send a note and always to remember someone's birthday and always to remember them at the holidays. Like those are just the nice extra touches that yeah. make it go a, a, an extra way. So there is that. Mm -hmm. Then there's keeping on top of everything that changes in this nutrition space which changes every day it seems <laughs> so you have but luckily I'm a tied to university so I get to hear about that and we have you know big players in the fields that are in the department so that's obviously helpful and then you have to manage the students right that that's the number one priority they know that I care about them and they know that all I'm doing every day is pushing them to be the best version of, the, of themselves mm -hmm. so that when they walk out they do have the chance to be the celebrity dietitian that they are hoping to be if that's what they want to be, or they want to be in the ICU in a hospital, you know, rounding with the, you know, the attending and telling the attending what to do for, with regards to nutrition, I'm going to make sure that they do that too. And, you know, giving them therapy and all of those things, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's just like, so there's, there's all of that, um, which is always great. It's great. It's great fun. It's also interesting when they all go into the hospitals, they give you differences of what's happening in those medical centers, right? Because every medical center has their own thing going on. So that's always interesting to hear what, what is happening. So there's that. And then with Kalina is, Kalina is a really interesting beast in and of itself because we are the first time that we're using tech and dietitians to make change in nutrition. Hmm. We're right. We're scaling our business. We are. We literally are, are about to close three million dollars in funding, seed funding, from investors, which is really exciting place to be. We bootstrap the whole business. We don't owe anybody any money. We are profitable, and we have sight line for profit. And so that's a piece that you don't actually learn. That yes. I'm able to that I'm able to teach the yeah. the students, which I think is invaluable because they come in and they say, "I'm gonna have my own private practice and that's gonna be great." And you're like, "Let me tell you actually what happens." <laughs> Welcome to reality. <laughs> come, come, let me help you. And then, and then it's like, listen, I'm just giving you all the tools. If this is if you if this still excites you and it's for you, there's plenty mm -hmm. of business out there. So I want you to go and do that. But yeah. I want you to have your eyes very open because if you think that 10% margin means profit, it does not. <laughs> so, right. so you are just a cog in a wheel. So remember that. And, you know, students tell me like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know all of those things. I never considered them. And now because of you, I have considered them and I can pivot and do different things. Because so I tell them if these things incite, excite you, you want to run payrolls that are tens of thousands of dollars. And if there's no, not enough money because insurance hasn't paid you, you are going to put that money up yourself. If that's okay for you every day, then you can, you can do this. You can run a business. If it's okay that your employees are just going to drop off because something happened in their family, you're going to have to pick up the slack. Then mm -hmm. that's, then that's fine. You have to be forward facing all the time. If, if that's the role that you want to play, cool. If that does not excite you, then you don't need to do that. And you are not less than. This is a whole other aspect. I mean, this is like a book on of itself. This just this simply this concept of, you know, first of all, just getting through and getting the education, but then also how to bring it to life, like what form it takes in you in the world and how, in, as you said, like what aspect, what what specifically are you passionate about? And then how do we execute? How do we get you there? That's right. That's right. Because it's so many different things. Like, it could be Hey, I want to do a podcast. I think that I would be the best as a podcast. Okay, well, this is how it works. Do you, are you a podcaster that's going to get advertisements? Is that how you're going to make your money? How do you make, and like, when you say those things to them, you can see their eyes light up because they're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think that that was possible. You're like, yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> so you, so it seems like to you too, you help guide them and maybe help them lean into their innate gifts, passions 
to help yeah. then formulate, okay, this is what it could manifest for you in, in the, in the space of science and medical in the medical world to help That's people. Right. That's right. That's right. That's cool. At the end of the day, we're here to help people. Like you're yeah. in a helping profession. You yeah. didn't become a dietitian because you wanted fame. Right. You did it because you thought you were going to help people change their lives. So yeah. how do we, like you said, use your gifts to do that? Cool. I love this. So first of all, congratulations on the seed funding. That's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. With Glow, we know what it's like to be bootstrapped and it's a big journey and appreciate yep. that and yep. congrats. So maybe we we could just dive into a little bit more about Kaluna Health. So it came to birth during the pandemic. Is that right? Yeah. So Tamar and I had known each other. I had actually trained her when she did her internship. Oh, I was okay. pregnant. I was pregnant with my son. And then Somebody asked for like a more holistic dietitian while I was working at the university. So I reached out to her and she had said like, oh, let's, let's meet up and have a coffee. I was like, oh, sure. And she's like, do you ever think about joining private practices? I'm like, I don't know. Sure. I, it doesn't bother me. Like we could. And she was like, okay, great. Let's do it. Like, yeah. Great. Like, why not? And so we did. And we were really honestly, Lisa, just going to be the two of us with two other practitioners and have a group practice. And, and it would be fun because there would be four of us and we would be able to re rely on each other and lean on each other. And that would be great. And I, I was doing some numbers and I said to her the other day, I go, this time last year we had six employees and we were um, a monthly run rate of $35,000. And this time now we are 15 dietitians with a run rate of $84,000 and wow. counting. And she was wow. like, and she was like, that's so crazy because we thought like the 35,000 was like so much and we were yeah. so excited and like, we're doing it. And then yeah. now it's like, it's, it's like beyond anything we ever thought could be. Um, yeah. But I, but yeah, we started in the pandemic. We took our first patient in July and then it just kept going. But I think it's because we talk about nutrition in an authentic way and we care about our patients and we are relatable and it's not about me or Tamar. It's about everybody that works. I always say it with us. It's always so weird. Like people work for me. It's bizarre feeling to say that. It's like they work with me. They, because they actually, if it's if it wasn't for these fifteen dietitians, I, well, where would we be? I'd be nowhere. I would be nowhere, right? And so I I know that they know that, um, and I appreciate what they do for us. Um, but yeah, we just we're busy and busy and busy, and it it's crazy and it's good. But it I, I think you know during the pandemic, people got sick of their Zoom happy hours and eating their feelings, and they were like, well, I can use my insurance and I can sit at my desk, so. I'll just, do, I'll do this. I think, okay, so a few things came to mind. So first of all, yes, the fact that you take insurance and that 90, you said, you mentioned that 91% of your, of folks that come to you actually utilize that, which is amazing. And then yep. I've spent some time on your website, the Kaluna Health website, and it did feel very welcoming, very inclusive. As you said, you approach nutrition in an authentic way, a relatable, accessible way. So it's not intimidating. And I love that your messages, because this is actually one of our messages to at Glow is we meet you where you are. Yeah. And with that sort of come as you are invitation, then it just feels like anything that they might be carrying with them, inhibitions or just any anything around it, judgments melts away and falls away. And I think that's super important. So I wonder if you could speak to that, because that seems to be really just baked into your ethos and just maybe touch on simply why that's so important, especially in a nutritional space. Yeah, I just think that it's funny. One of the investors asked the other day, what do you do with someone's environmental factors? Like, how do you help change that? And I was like, well, I can't change that. I can't change your socioeconomic status. I can't change the fact that you might have one leg or are insulin dependent diabetic. All I can do is give strategies to help mitigate the impact and let you know that you are worthy of health, whatever that means to you. So it's not a, necessarily that you like come to me and you're like, I need to lose 50 pounds. Every time somebody says that to me, like I want to lose 50 pounds. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So we're not, <laughs> let's just try the fact that like 
you don't drink water. <laughs> like, right. and everyone, nobody ever wants to drink water. Everyone's like, just, it's cold and wet. Just drink the water. So <laughs> let's work on that this week. Come back to me. You know? <laughs> and the, like, so I think when they see that yeah. and they're like, oh, right. I always, when I talk to you for the first time, I just listen to you and like, what is your day like? What is your life like? And then the first thing I tell you is not something about food necessarily, but just something about like some self-care habit that will make the food better. I don't talk about science and all that until like session five, because like mm-hmm. you, I got to like order your life first. And so, yeah. so maybe it's like, I drink a bottle of wine every night. I'm like, great. This week, drink a bottle of wine every other night and come back to me. Right. Baby steps. Right? Yeah. Baby steps. And yeah. and when they're like, oh, I did that. Then you feel good about yourself. And then yeah. you, you, you've bought in and now we keep working, right? Mm-hmm. So let's work on some behaviors first so that the food part isn't that hard because it's the behavior that we, we have to change first. Yeah. yeah so what do you want to do? What makes you feel good? Maybe for you, you're a size 22 and you want to be a size 20. We can work towards that. Let's work towards that. Right. You don't have to be a size zero, especially because like you, you were never a size zero anyways. So don't, don't think today at 45, it's going to happen. Like let's, let's, let's manage this. So, so less overwhelm and it also just reminds me of the, the whole concept of progress over perfection. Yeah. You know, just taking it one step at a time. One step at a time. It's like, and also working, working it every day, being consistent. I always use my daughter as an example that she's in fourth grade. So it's this like transition year and she's very smart, but she's unlike her mother. I'm very like type A organized. She's like her father. Everything is like messy, but she's like, but it's fine. Right. And so, but I try to tell her. You have to do this every single day. If you do this every single day, the consistency is what matters. And so the other day she was like, I studied every day and I got a hundred easily and I wasn't overwhelmed. I was like, I mean, I know it's hard to listen (laughs) to me, your mother, but yeah. And like, that's what I'm, I'm striving for, for her. Right. It's like, I'm not on your back every day because I want you to be perfect. I'm actually trying to make it easier for you because I've identified for you that you are somebody who needs to do it every day. You can't, you're not somebody that's going to study like her brother, her little brother, who's like, I'm going to five minutes before I get a hundred. And so, (laughs) which is like enraging in and of itself. But so, (laughs) so that's the thing for the clients. I'm like, guys, if you do this every day, every day, I want you to put carrot sticks at your lunch. Well, I like to eat chips with my sandwich. I didn't say not to eat the chips. I asked you to put the carrot sticks because that's the one vegetable that you say you'll eat with it. Okay. What happens? Hey, by the end of the week, I just like stopped really eating the chips. I know. <laughs> yeah, so it's like This is awesome. So many times, so many things that you've said so far reminds me of on your IG profile. You say not a magician, but pretty close. Yeah. Like so many yeah. things you've said are, are that's coming to mind. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think of mindfulness practices and meditation practices and how it is the cumulative effect, how it does pay off over time. And I love that your daughter had this example for her because it's not until you experience, like she can hear you talk about it all the time and your patients can hear you all the time, but right. until they actually experience it and embody right. it, now they start to wake up, you know, the awareness, right. like the, the light bulb moments start going That's right. Off. And you know, when they come in there, it was like, okay, what's the plan? What's <laughs> the plan? And I'm like, I don't, like, do you have a paper? Yeah. They're like, Is there a paper? And you're like, I'm not giving a paper. It's Even, like, like the wise sage in the meditation, like, I want you to go eat five st- carrot sticks and come back to me. Yeah. And like, and tell me what you, yeah. Tell me yeah. what you've learned. But it's just so <laughs> funny because even, even the other day, one of the investors, we were like, yeah, just like come on the platform and like experience it. And so when she, so then she calls and she's like, so like I walked away with no paper in my hand. I'm like, uh-huh. And she was with one of our RDs, Jason, who was like, I mean, he's great. And she was like, but I felt like I have to go back, not because I need the paper, but because everything that Jason gave me, like I was hanging on, I needed more. I'm like, yeah, exactly. She's like, she's like, I didn't need the paper. And then she's like, wait, I didn't need the paper, but I lost two pounds just by doing a couple of things that he told me to do. And I was like, I know. Wow. No paper. 
you, you'll get the paper later. We have the papers for right. you. We have all the papers. <laughs> We're a real company. There are papers, there are sheets, there are PDFs, there are links. Like, it's not a problem. But, but that's not what you need right now. <laughs> I'm cracking up because this is so true and it's ringing so true. Okay, back to Kalina. So I signed up for your newsletter, by the way. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it was cool because I was given, so everyone gets this for free. If you sign up, you get the newsletter, then you get access to the Eating Awareness Journal. So we get a paper. Yeah, we get a paper with, with a logo. It makes we get you feel a little paper. Good. So I just wanted to just touch on this importance of tracking what's working, not working, and more so keeping a food and mood diary to help show you how those two are connected. Because I think some people may be semi aware of it, but not fully seeing the whole picture until they actually track it, write it down, and are able to take a step back and sort of look at the overarching themes that keep coming up. Yeah, you know, I think like the narrative out there these days is like, don't track your food, because it's going to give you disordered eating. And you're like, I mean, if that is your tendency, I'm going to identify that from us talking, and I'm not going to have you track your food. I am skilled. I know, I know what mm -hmm. to do and what not to do. But yeah. if you're just like the general population, who really is just trying to make sense of your day to day, this is helpful for you. And so you'll see like, I got really stressed out at work. And so I and then my friend had cookies. And so I ate three cookies. And it's like, okay, then I go back to that. I'm like, what were you thinking about? And then you get this story of like, oh, yeah, I noticed like when I come home from work, the first thing I do is I open up a cabinet and I eat like the sweets out of the cabinet. And it's like, okay, well, would you, would it be fair to say that you're somebody who need, wants to feel better immediately? And so for you, you go to that sugar because that is what brings you up. That's like, that's science. And then they're like, huh, yes. <laughs> and you're like, okay, let's do something to make a change. So I want you to take the one cookie and then I want you to go outside and go for a walk and eat the cookie on the mm. walk. Mm, I love that. Right? Like, now yeah. I'm going to give you tools. I'm not shaming you. I'm not telling you not to eat. I'm not doing any of those things. But I, I've also identified that you take in an extra 1,500 calories from the moment you walk into your house before you even eat your dinner. Mm -hmm. So let me help you stop doing that and make you understand why. Because we can rewire the brain. We can retrain the brain. But we have to understand why we do the things that we do. That's right. Oh, so good. Okay. All right. So again, meeting people where they are. And even that education alone about rewiring the brain, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, I'm a neuroscience nerd. I love geeking out on that stuff. And so I think that's so important that you integrate that into your education with your patients. And then the other thing I received was the step-by-step -step guide to changing your unhealthy habits. I love that there's these, these generous offerings just sort of right off the bat to get you starting to think about things and especially yeah. gives you an idea of, of your mindset and your approach. So I think that's super nice. So for anyone listening that's interested, and we'll have all the links in the show notes, but I encourage you to check out Kalina Health. There's also great blog articles there as well. I just wanted to touch on inflammation and, and how food plays a role and how inflammation is the precursor to many autoimmune conditions and other conditions. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people with autoimmune disease have markers in their DNA, right? And then there's like some sort of trigger. So for example, one of our very good friends got COVID and then got type one diabetes at 47 years old, right? And he's like, how did this happen to me? I was like, well, you, you have the marker and mm -hmm. then the COVID made it happen. And lucky for him, one of his best friends is a dietitian. So he has like, he's a very controlled diabetic and things are going okay for him. But we talk through the food all the time, right? Because he's like very hyper-focused on the anti-inflammatory diet and, um, you know, like not having too much fat and, you know, making sure that like his vision is good and he doesn't have neuropathy and, and all of these things. Um, so, but he's not a big vegetable eater. And mm. so I, <laughs> and when he eats a lot at our house, so every time he comes over, I just like put a mound of greens on his plate, right? And they're like, here you go, this is for you. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. But you know, you want to, not that you have to not eat meat, right? You can eat meat and still be 
anti-inflammatory, right? Like you, you can, it's the culmination, right? It's the aggregate of all of the food, not just right. one single item. And so of course you can have a slice of pizza once in a while. And of course you can have French fries, right? But I mean, if you're somebody who's eating French fries and hamburgers and hot dogs and pizza and soda and alcohol and you know everything is overly processed then you have a problem that also means you know I tell people all the time like cashew cheese like cashews aren't supposed to be cheese so that is a processed item overly processed so there's no difference between that and like McDonald's french fries it's the same mm -hmm. <laughs> like so you got to think about that it's okay if you if you're allergic to cheese or allergic to cheese we can try to, if you love the cheese we can try to figure out ways for you to be able to have some cheeses some cheeses don't have lactose we can figure that out like maybe dairy doesn't sit with you then you have to avoid it i get it but mm -hmm. we have to be thinking about those things but mostly plants lean protein minimizing the process you know, we don't want to be drinking tons of alcohol anyway, because our bodies have to work really hard. And I'm going to be 43 on Saturday. I feel like if I drink a glass of wine, it's like ruined me for like the next six months. So it's just like not worth it for me anymore. <laughs> um, I'm but, with you, know, you. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I feel like, do I have a drink? I'm like, no, I want to sleep. Like, that's more <laughs> yeah. important to me. Um, so, so, you know, all of those things are what matters, but, but every, you know, it's like the buzzword, like no gluten, no dairy, this, that, and the other thing. It's like, well, we're okay. It's yeah. okay. Right. You can have a piece of cheese. Nothing's going to happen to you. You can have a piece of steak. Like if you go to a farm and get an organic grass fed piece of beef, it's okay. If you're eating that every single week, multiple times a week, now we have a problem. Right. So those are the things that people have to think about. Um, but it's not one size fits all, right? Like you have an autoimmune disease, but perhaps gluten is okay for you. You mm -hmm. don't, you don't react to that, but dairy is something that triggers you. We don't know, or, and it's vice versa for someone else or dairy and gluten are the things that you omit and everything is better. It depends. Some fruits yeah. are okay. Some aren't. That's the thing. It's, it's really about precision and personalized medicine, not, yep. um, not the one size fits all. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, and also I just I, the thought came to mind as you were speaking about the cashew cheese, paying attention to how you feel after eating it, right? right. Like, <laughs> right, right. Like, were your cells vibrating and you were feeling really good, or was there some type of reaction? Yeah, I'm fairly certain there were your stomach bloated and it didn't feel good. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I I tried it and I I thought it was interesting and an interesting concept. This was years ago, but my body said, no, thank you. Right. Yeah. Cause your body did like, the thing is anything overly processed just right. like doesn't work. That's why it's always so funny to me when people are like, pizza is so bad. I'm like, but you know, if you think about it, pizza is like not really overly processed, right? It's like flour, yeah. water, cheese, tomato sauce. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Maybe add some vegetables to it. You can also get gluten free. Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. But like when you're talking through those things, like, any, any, like when people are like, oh, I have this keto bar. Can I, do you want to try it? I'm like, no, thank you. Like, so brands try to like offer me things all the time. And I, I want to, you know, say like, yes, but like, these are not things I would ever promote ever because I wouldn't eat them myself. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not, I'm not saying that your thing is bad. I'm just saying it's just not for me. And I just can't share it with my audience and apologies, right? Like that's, yeah. that's all because, because I'm not really into things that are overly processed. Just yeah. not. Well, I love that you're living the example and, and walking the talk, so to speak. So yeah. that's super important. Leading by example. Yeah. All my patients are like, what bars do you like? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> make and your own like, bar. <laughs> yeah. Make your own bar. I'm like, I don't know. I guess like a kind bar is okay. And a quick pinch if you like it. I don't know. Like, I, I don't like them. They're like, you don't? Yeah. I'm like, I don't like protein shakes. I don't like bars. I just don't like them. Sorry. Yeah. Same. I can never find one I love. Me neither. It's, and people will say like, try this bar. It's so delicious. And you're like, okay, great. And then you get it. And you're like, what are all these ingredients? I don't want yeah. this. <laughs> I'd rather put a little jar together of like Himalayan raisins and some little dark chocolate pieces yep. and some nuts or something and make my own yep. thing. Yeah. Yep. Same. Same. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um. So let me, so just overall thoughts on what to eat when feeling 
because we are, as we mentioned, like this time of sort of overwhelm and anxiety, are there specific foods, maybe just highlight a, a few if you don't mind, that are helpful to eat when feeling overwhelmed and having a moment of panic or anxiety that could maybe even help calm you down? Calm you down. Yeah. So this is what I always say, first of all, when people feel like a lot of anxiety or whatever, and they're like, and then I have a glass of wine. I'm like, no, <laughs> that not going to or coffee or something yeah, that's going to just rev it up more yeah right? yeah. yeah i'm like god this is bad <laughs> like, we're like really or like like i don't know i have so much anxiety i'm like because you drink all the time it's not good for you your body is like withdrawing you need to they're like oh like, okay so there is that because it is interesting when you've eaten something that your body is having trouble processing your heart rate goes up and when your heart that's rate right. goes up you feel anxious about the heart rate going up and then your heart rate goes up because you're being anxious. So it's sort of yeah. this cycle. Crazy continues. cycle. Yeah. So I always tell people like, it does actually matter what time you eat too. Like mm. if you're eating sugary things at night before bed, your body is going to be metabolizing that. And you're going to like wake up at two o'clock in the morning with like a panic because mm. your body is processing that. So I, I say like, have a piece of fruit and have some nuts or whatever, because that's going to slow down the digestion. You know, almonds have magnesium. Magnesium is something that calms you. Also, one thing that I would do is I used to take like um, the, a banana peel and steep it in water mm. because it like helps, like the magnesium from the peel helps to calm you down. Also oh. like, a, yeah, or like a turmeric, like I'll just do like a turmeric tea. So I'll boil water with lime and ginger root in the kettle. And then I'll pour that into a, a mug and I'll do some turmeric and a little bit of cinnamon and it's delicious and calming. It's Ooh. one of my favorite things. <laughs> I'm going to try that. That's such a great, great one for um, the season too, for the, yep. in where we are in, in yeah, for the winter season. Okay, cool. I love those. So I really want to get to these questions as many as we can get to. Yeah. So digestion begins in the mouth with chewing, with the excretion of, of saliva and enzymes. And enzymes deplete as we get older, right? The the natural enzyme production. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So yep. so chewing, chewing in a fast paced world is like a tricky thing for people, I feel like. Yeah, but it's so funny, right? Because everyone's always trying to like drink all of their nutrients. That's the right. other thing. This is I think this is why I don't like, like smoothies. Remember like in like the early two thousands, everyone was like, Jamba juice. I'm like, I just don't why would you do this? Like this is so weird. Right. And yeah. so when you chew and you start to like move your your salivary glands around and like right once you like the amylase comes in that starts to um, stimulate like the stomach secretions, right? And like peristalsis and like digestion. And as you get older, also digestion slows. There's less hydrochloric acid in your stomach. There's less movement. And so this just like causes problems for people. So like chew your food, take your time, do not rush. Take 25 minutes out of your day to sit and eat your meals breakfast you can do that because you can eat it before you leave your house get up a little bit earlier lunchtime no one is going to die if you just don't look at your email for 25 minutes i promise it's gonna be okay and then like at night that's the time for you to decompress with your family right or if you live alone fine whatever but just your time why are you rushing through it where are you going you're not going anywhere now now you're home so you don't have to like rush to eat your meal so if we just take more time to do that your digestion overall is going to be better. You're going to feel better. You're going to be able to taste your food more, really know what you like and what you don't like. It's just better better for your overall health. That's why I love about so many other cultures too, other than American cultures. They really, it's an experience. It's a yes. way to connect with loved ones and really celebrate the food. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When growing up, we went to Switzerland every summer to stay with my aunt and she had a chalet in France. And I had yeah. these like French friends, right? They would like come and pick me up. Like my, my aunt would open the chalet and then be like, where are the feet? Like, where are the girls? Where are the girls? And she'd be like, I'm going to get them. And so we would all go to the beach in the morning, like this lake area, and we would be with our friends. And then at lunchtime, everybody would leave because we had to go back home to eat these like extravagant meals that my mm. aunt would make, like roasted chicken and harry couvert and 
salads and all these things that we had to eat that we had to wait 45 minutes to digest and relax. Then we could go back to be with our friends. Then we had to come back for dinner and like do it all over again. My sister and I were like, this is mental. <laughs> like, what is <laughs> So foreign to you, but what a great experience to have at that age. Also, Lisa, every year, right, I would leave and then I would go back home and like, you know, you would have your physical. So I'm like 15 years old and the doctor would be like, you lost 20 pounds since last time you came. And it was like every year. And I'd be like, when I was like, she doesn't have any disorder. She literally eats every meal, but she spent the whole summer in Europe where all the, you know, everything everything is small and all this. So it's, she's fine. Yeah. And you'd be like, yeah, I get it. Cause like, I didn't have any of those manifestations, but he always marveled at it. And then one year on the other he's like, I should send my son with you next summer. Cause you can benefit. From <laughs> being Seriously. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I was grateful to get to um, Italy a few years ago. My first time really in spending time, like in the countryside and I, yeah having, you know, Hashimoto's and I ate everything I, when I was there, everything I didn't hold back. And I, no issues, not yeah. one autoimmune flare up. Not yeah. one. I mean, I know, and I understand everyone's different. So I'm just explaining from my experience. I really just enjoyed immersing myself in the experience of just, of just eating food. It was so amazing. The quality of their food is higher and the way that they're um flat like the way that they mill their flour is different so Mm -hmm. people tend to do better if they when they have autoimmune issues like and they're avoiding dairy and gluten they usually do better when they go to italy i hear that a lot actually so next time you're on i will be in we'll be doing this and i'll be in my villa in italy then Um, i I will be with you you could be there yeah Perfect. We will be together. The more the merrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll yeah, be coming yeah. to you live from. <laughs> yes, I'll cook all the food. We'll cook, we'll cook it together. It'll be good. It'll be good. <laughs> of course, next to the villa will be our garden, and of, you know we'll be course. we'll be having live classes educating people about growing yeah, gardens fresh, and yeah, fresh fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Don't laugh. I made my kids' school by um by hydroponic gardens. <laughs> oh. This is amazing. Okay, I'd love to touch on this next. Things that you, you're you doing in your community to help educate. This is very important. If I had learned, I grew up with a garden, but it wasn't really integrated into our school system. You're helping educate kids at a young age how amazing nature is and our planet and what it can provide for us. So, yeah. so I'm going to touch on that, how you're how you're helping your, your, your children's school system. Yeah, so... It's really crazy because we pay for our kids to go to school and their school lunch is atrocious. It's like the sword I'm going to die on. It's so ridiculous, but whatever. That's like neither here nor there. So I helped with a fundraiser last year and single-handedly like raised like $30,000 for the school. So I was like, great, this is my chance. So I weasel my way in and I'm like, hey, I think we should have these tower gardens. They're hydroponic gardens. The students can grow them, take care of them, and then they can pick fresh fruits and vegetables and eat them with their lunches. And so, you know, the the principal is like, okay, fine. And then I also got her to agree that I would come in and start with second and fourth grade because those are my kids' ages um, and do class. So I'm teaching nutrition to them which is like great i also want to you know obviously get into the higher grades but she's letting me do that so in january i will go in and i will start teaching kids about digestion and amylase and enzymes and all of those things and you know like how does food affect your body how does it fuel you there's no good food or bad food it's just These are the macronutrients. This is what they do. This is why they're important. And this is how we piece it together. Because that's how I talk to my kids and they get it, right? They'll be like, I need to have a protein here so that I can feel full. Rocco is like, I need to have a vegetable because my mother is a monster and she makes me eat a vegetable at lunch (laughs) and at dinner. (laughs) Well, this is so important that that you're getting in there at a young age. This is what we need in every, especially underserved communities, but these types of programs are so important. Yeah. So Glow is a platform where we have meditation, yoga, Pilates. Yep. So I just wanted to touch on fueling the body for movement. Mm-hmm. Because I know for me, if, if I'm not carefully fueling myself for movement, I will come out the other end more depleted than I was. Yeah, I think that for so long, the narrative was like to restrict all the time. And then there's this like, 
fasted exercise, then that mimics intermittent fasting. And like, everything is about just like weight loss and not about being strong. Like I don't exercise because I want to lose weight. I exercise so that I'm not crippled. I want to be like 80 years old, moving my body, making sure my core is strong. Like my muscles are strong. That's why I do that. And so how can I sustain a 90 minute hot yoga class if I only drank water. Like it's just like right. not gonna work. <laughs> it just makes no sense. But I but I think that people will see like maybe like extreme athletes or bodybuilders or anybody and then they just like automatically compare themselves to those people. Mm. It's like you don't you're doing something that this person isn't doing. Like you, you need to just stay in your own lane. But yeah. you can it doesn't have to be like uh, and a, a traditional American breakfast with like bacon and eggs and pancakes, right? You can have a piece of toast with avocado. You can have a yogurt with some fruit. You can, like, you know, I mean, whatever it is that will, you know, oatmeal with some fruit and some, like small amounts of food that can just fuel you, right? You, every cell in your body craves glucose because that's what we, that's our energy store. And so when mm. you're, when you're exercising, you're depleting the muscles of glycogen. And so you're going to feel weak. So, and what is the first thing the body is going to use? What's next up protein. So you're ripping the muscles and then you're not seeing any fruits of your labor. So you need to eat food, everybody. <laughs> Don't be afraid. They may think like, Oh, I didn't eat. And then I burned 400 calories. So like, I'm good. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. oh, work. <laughs> and it c catches up to you after so long. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't yeah, feel good. We need to nourish our bodies. Yeah, don't be afraid. Just eat yeah. the food. The more you eat, the less likely you are to binge somewhere else. Right. And the better off you're going to be long term. So you're more satisfied. So you're less apt to grab. X, y, yeah, whatever it is for you. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's so good. I wish they all <laughs> okay. listened. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, we're all getting there. I mean, it is unfortunate in social and other places. We, as you said, and you mentioned celebrities earlier, like there are a lot of these bells and whistles to get yeah. our attention where if we can just move all of that aside, hone in in your alley, what's going on with you specifically and just focus right there. That's right. You will be yeah. better off. The other day, my friend who has ADHD found an ADHD dietitian, and she was like, this dietitian." everything she said, like resonated with me, focused me. There is, when you have ADD, the way that you eat or how you do things, it, it is a thing. And she was like, mm -hmm. this has changed my world. And I was like, I'm so happy for you. Right? Like that, that's the thing. Look for people who you resonate with, who you feel can really guide you and help you and not be so much all over the place. But that's not really, yeah. gonna, not the thing. Yeah. Nor will it be sustainable, right? Like That's you right. might be on it for a week or a month or, and then all of a sudden you're back to where you're That's right. So That's we right. want to, yeah. we want to, yeah. Long-term goals and just stay, stay in the course. That's right. The course. Realistic, realistic, realistic. Stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. I have a few questions from our glow team members that heard you were coming on the podcast. Today. Oh, cool. Okay. So question one. You've sure. had dinner too early and find yourself hungry as you're getting into bed and and now you're unable to fall asleep. If you could have like a little snack, what would that be at that time? Like some crackers and peanut butter. That's Perfect. a good one. Or you could also do like half of an English muffin. Just because there's nothing wrong with this, the whole English muffin. I'm not saying it because we're trying to restrict calories. I'm saying it because then maybe you're going to, fall asleep and lay down and then you're not going to feel so good. So mm -hmm. you just want to really be paying attention to what's happening after that, right? Like, can you be upright for an hour? Right. So keep it small, but keep small. it small. Yeah. And a little bit of protein. Mm -hmm. The oatmeal is good because oatmeal, ha you know, has properties that's going to help you fall asleep. You could also try a tea, like to help fall asleep and then not actually eat because then you're going to lay down and then maybe you're going to have reflux. I just, everything goes back to reflux for me. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Same. But yeah. Yeah. So that, Tea is good because only... it might actually f make, help you feel fulfilled, sort of trick the brain almost. That's right. That's right. And then, and if it's a yeah. calming tea, then you've got that added benefit too. Yep. Okay, cool. Your one or two takeaway tips for eating during travel. 
So people are coming up on traveling oh. more of the holidays. Yeah, somebody um, just asked me about this too. They're like, what do you do when you're getting on a plane? And I'm like, well, first of all, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a nervous flyer, you don't want to eat anything that's like too processed that's going to cause like GI distress. So you don't want that. Um, I always like make sure that I bring the things that are like fibrous and filling and make sure that I have enough water just because like you're not in your right element. It just like causes your stomach to kind of be out of whack. But if you can really make sure, like I always have chia seeds, I like throw them in my oatmeal or I'll get a, a yogurt and like mix it in just so that, I, and like, I always have like electrolyte tabs just to, like make sure I'm hydrated properly and that I'm getting enough fiber, even though like I'm left to, the mercy of wherever I'm at. Like my mm -hmm. mother was like, "Ugh, Vanessa and her vegetables. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I suspect there's something to having though, when, it can, when you're traveling, as you said, the anxiety that comes with that, um, yeah. having things on you that feel familiar, brings some comfort to you. And exactly, way, so. exactly. So I'm always like, just bring, I literally ha take like the chia seeds and I just put them in a Ziploc and I'm like, here it is. That is going, uh. I can, I can eat oatmeal every single day. And I could add two tablespoons in, that's 11 grams of fiber. So I'm almost halfway there, right? And then yeah. I, you know, I can make, you know, vegetables at lunch and dinner and I have a piece of fruit and I, I should get in there. It should be okay. And do you put chia seeds in the water or in any drink and drink them as well? No, because it, like I've tried to put it in like just plain water to see, but yeah. it just like congeals really weirdly. So what yeah. I do is I'll take the two tablespoons, I put it at the bottom of a bowl, and then I make quick oats with almond milk, and then I dump it and mix it up, and then I add raspberries, and it's like mm. I, the perfect like easy winter breakfast. And yeah. the ras a whole container of raspberries is eight grams of fiber, so now I'm like at twenty grams of fiber basically, and I'm like, wow. okay, great, here I am. Now, now whatever I eat for the rest of the day will be bonus and I will make it. Right. Oh, that's so good. You're making me hungry. Yeah. 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 It's an easy this way, is... easy way to get the fiber. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't think people think of raspberries and fiber, you know, like it's. Yeah. Yeah. Eight grams for one cup. So easy. Amazing. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, and then this may be a loaded question, but holiday help. Um, one big takeaway. So the thing I say to people about the holidays is you have to give yourself grace. Number one, nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. If you had an extra cookie, don't go out with your friends and try to be like enjoying time with people and be overly controlling about everything that's around. Number two, do not not eat food. Don't starve yourself in anticipation of going yeah. to an event. Just eat normally throughout the day at your normal cadence so that you don't binge at some party. Also, you could just say, no, mm. you don't have to go to every single thing. <laughs> like, there you go. You know, right. You could get like, some rest. Yeah. Yeah. And just some take rest. care. Like, right. Like, obviously I want to go and be with my friends who I've been friends with for 20 years and they're having a party. Like, yes, of course I want to go to that, but like, I don't need to go to like every, you know, the three work parties. I can yeah. just pick one and that's, right. that's it. Right. So that's another thing that people forget. Like just sign up. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Those are great takeaways. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Grace. Okay. Everyone. Yeah. Give yourself some yourself. grace. Yeah. Yes. Be kind to yourself. Yes. It's cool. You're good. And I had this thought too, cause I, I give to the LA mission every year here, the mm -hmm. LA mission, they help. They're basically on the front lines of providing meals and safe shelter and hot showers to people in need. And so I always feel like that's sort of a helpful, it just, it, it just, in my experience, you just become more, so much more grateful for what you have and the access, you know, to food that you have once you give. And I know you're a big proponent of that, of, of yes. helping soup kitchens and et cetera. All of that. I actually, people talk about this all the time and I'm like, oh no, other people don't do this. I actually give my kids garbage bags at the, at, you know, December 1st, where's the garbage bag? Please mm -hmm. go through everything. And I do the same thing. Please go through everything that you are not using anymore so that we can donate these things. And they're like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then and when we go to church, they pick something off of the giving tree. But I'm like, okay, great. Now pony up your cash. And now let's go get something for the person that you picked off the giving tree. Like you have to nice. be pay doing forward. those. Pay forward. Yeah. Do those things yourselves. And so like they get it. But yeah, like it's doing these things 
makes you so grateful. And I usually on my birthday, I go to the soup kitchen and I give to Pete and I, you know, serve meals. And it's always such an eye opening experience because the people at the soup kitchen, yes, a lot of them don't have maybe homes, et cetera, but a lot of them are just yeah. like the working poor. And that's yeah. very interesting to see. Yeah. Very eye opening. Yeah. It makes you think of things in a different way. Yeah. And real quickly back to, um, you know, the gardening aspect, just so much more appreciation for the planet. And I think that really helps with even eco anxiety. I was on yep. a podcast with Heather White and we were speaking, she's an environmentalist and it just nurtures that relationship with the planet and all that it offers us in terms of nourishment. So yep. I love, love that. Yeah. So I want to, as we wind down here, get to some of your self-care non-negotiables, what fills your cup so that you're able to show up for your family and your colleagues and your patients. Yeah, I actually have this like meditation group. So we we do meditation together, which is like so wonderful. Um, and the, the meditation does like help me for sure. Um, also, I go on these like six mile long walks with my dog just oh, wow. every day, me and Freddie. Freddie was, um, came to us during COVID. Our dog had, our dog died and my husband was like so sad. So we got, so I like in the middle of the night, like emailed these people and I was like, my dog, my husband cries every day, please give me a dog. I know there are no dogs available. And they're like, sure. So they give us Freddie and he walks, he walks like nine miles a day and I give him a six mile walk every day. And if I don't do it in a timely way, he like looks out the window and looks back at me longingly and like cries. (laughs) I'm like, I'm coming for you. It's like our time, but it is like really special time. And it is a, it's a place for me to just like, I don't know, like nothing matters. It's just like me and the dog and we just like walk along the water and it's, it's helpful. I know yeah. it sounds crazy, but it is. No, is this like a mindfulness walk yeah. in, its, in its own way? Yeah. 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 Is, so I have a question for you because I love long walks too. Would yeah. you take, now, depending how you've nourished yourself prior to the walk, would you maybe take something on the walk with you? I don't think so because normally, I don't know. I feel like I always eat before. Like it's like uh-huh. I time it before it takes like an hour and like 10 minutes and it's like I do the same route all the time and it's just like I mean Freddie doesn't even drink water I try to get him to there's like all these little like water (laughs) stuff and he's like I'm good I'll get there when I get home so (laughs) so we just like do our thing and and go on our walk um but maybe I think like when it is really hot outside I will bring like my like an electrolyte tablet and like a little small water bottle but that's that's really it. Okay. And yeah. so, okay. So the meditation group walking with, with Freddie. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much it. That's where those I are like good ones. Yeah. I like good. those because yeah. you also brought in the nature element. Yeah. As you said, yeah. like looking, they've researched now about just looking at, at nature and what that does yeah. for the brain and everything. Yeah. So, okay, that's sometimes cool. my, sometimes my husband will be like, let's drop the kids off at school and then you can walk Freddie. And I'm like, I really don't want to walk with you, actually. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, because you want to talk, and I don't want to yeah. talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's your time. It's your, yeah. it's you and Freddie. Yeah, it's <laughs> like Marley and me. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, we have some glow classes that support digestion, so I thought I'd include that playlist in the in the show notes as well. So I'll yeah, I'll have those. that's very cool. I want to see them and and do yeah. them. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll share. Yeah. I'll sh- I'll email you with those as well. Cool. So, where as we wind down here, where can our listeners find out more just about you and your work and what's coming up? Anything coming up next for you and your endeavors? Yeah, yeah um, they can go to kalinahealth.com or Kalina Health on Instagram, and there you can also find my Instagram, which is Vanessa Rosetto RD. That's where I sort of tell everybody all the things that we are doing. Um, but right now, it's now that we're done fundraising, I will just work, go back to working because fundraising, okay. as you know, is like a full-time job. And so now yeah. I'll just go back to running a company and that's, that and feels good. And putting all now. that good money to work and all that's the right. magical things for next iterations. That's right. And that's all right. The goodness. Yeah. yeah. But we're going to build out this tech platform and, and compete in that digital health space. And that feels good because people will be able to use their insurance. Yes. So it's, uh, yeah. It's so important. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the goodness that you're doing yeah. in the world and in, in, in our world and in our communities. And for, I feel like for every person you help educate and impact, 
they're likely going to impact others in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so all of this essentially, you know, just to help raise awareness and help us grow individually and, and collectively. So yeah, thanks again for joining us today and, and happy almost birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa. And I hope we can have you um, on again sometime. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I really enjoyed was, this. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our entire team behind the scenes at GLOW. I'm so grateful for your care and commitment to serving our members around the world. Thank you to our teachers for so beautifully sharing your gifts and talents. I'm also grateful to our lovely community of GLOW members. You've supported us since 2008, and because of you, we get to continue to do the work we love. It's the combined support of our team, our teachers, and our community that grants me the privilege to continue to bring you the GLOW podcast. Thank you to Lee Schneider at Red Cub Agency for production support. And the beautiful music you're hearing now is by Carrie Rodriguez and her husband, Luke Jacobs. And remember, take care of yourself because our world needs you. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. You can find The Glow Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or glo.com slash podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Derek Mills.